Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Laura, Oyen, Angel, Barbara, and Stacy, whose husband Jason purchased her a Patreon membership as a Christmas gift. Merry Christmas, Stacy. I'd like to thank all of you for becoming supporters of this podcast. By joining Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. Just a reminder... All of you and everyone else who supports us by December 24th, either on Patreon or through a one-time tip on buymeacoffee.com, will be entered into a raffle for a three-month free subscription to Libro.fm, which will entitle you to three free audiobooks and a profit split with the independent bookstore of your choice. If you're interested in getting your name in the hat or just want to learn more about supporting us. You'll find links to Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight we're relaxing with two essays by Henry David Thoreau. The first appeared in a collection called Excursions, first published in 1863. And the second is a chapter included in his classic, Walden. Let's begin. Night and Moonlight Chancing to take a memorable walk by moonlight some years ago, I resolved to take more such walks and make acquaintance with another side of nature. I have done so. According to Pliny, there is a stone in Arabia called Selenite, wherein is a white which increases and decreases with the moon. My journal for the last year or two has been selenitic in this sense. Is not the midnight like Central Africa to most of us? Are we not tempted to explore it, to penetrate to the shores of its Lake Chad and discover the source of its Nile? perchance the mountains of the moon. Who knows what fertility and beauty, moral and natural, are there to be found. In the mountains of the moon, in the central Africa of the night, this is where all Niles have their hidden heads. The expeditions up the Nile as yet extend but to the cataracts, or perchance to the mouth of the White Nile. But it is the Black Nile that concerns us. I shall be a benefactor if I conquer some realms from the night, if I report to the gazettes anything transpiring about us at that season worthy of their attention, if I can show men that there is some beauty awake while they are asleep if I add to the domains of poetry. Night is certainly more novel and less profane than day. I soon discovered that I was acquainted only with its complexion, and as for the moon, I had seen her only as it were through a crevice in a shutter occasionally. Why not walk a little way in her light? Suppose you attend to the suggestions which the moon makes for one month, commonly in vain. 
will it not be very different from anything in literature or religion? But why not study this Sanskrit? What if one moon has come and gone with its world of poetry, its weird teachings, its oracular suggestions? So divine a creature freighted with hints for me, and I have not used her, one moon gone by unnoticed. I think it was Dr. Chalmers who said, criticizing Coleridge, that for his part he wanted ideas which he could see all round, and not such as he must look at away up in the heavens. Such a man, one would say, would never look at the moon, because she never turns her other side to us. The light which comes from ideas, which have their orbit as distant from the earth, and which is no less cheering and enlightening to the benighted traveler than that of the moon and stars, is naturally reproached or nicknamed as moonshine by such. They are moonshine, are they? Well, then do your night traveling when there is no moon to light you. But I will be thankful for the light that reaches me from the star of least magnitude. Stars are lesser or greater, only as they appear to us so. I will be thankful that I see so much as one side of a celestial idea, one side of the rainbow and the sunset sky. Men talk glibly enough about moonshine, as if they knew its qualities very well and despised them, as owls might talk of sunshine. None of your sunshine. But this word commonly means merely something which they do not understand, which they are abed and asleep to, however much it may be worth their while to be up and awake to it. It must be allowed that the light of the moon, sufficient though it is for the pensive walker, and not disproportionate to the inner light we have, is very inferior in quality and intensity to that of the sun. But the moon is not to be judged alone by the quantity of light she sends to us, but also by her influence on the earth and its inhabitants. The moon gravitates toward the earth, and the earth reciprocally toward the moon. The poet who walks by moonlight is conscious of a tide in his thought which is to be referred to lunar influence. I will endeavor to separate the tide in my thoughts from the current distractions of the day. I would warn my hearers that they must not try my thoughts by a daylight standard, but endeavor to realize that I speak out of the night. All depends upon your point of view. In Drake's collection of voyages, Wafer says of some albinos among the Indians of Darien, they are quite white, but their whiteness is like that of a horse, quite different from the fair or pale European, as they have not the least tincture of a blush or sanguine complexion. Their eyebrows are milk white, as is likewise the hair of their heads, which is very fine. They seldom go abroad in the daytime, the sun being disagreeable to them, and causing their eyes, which are weak and pouring, to water, especially if it shines towards them. Yet they see very well by moonlight, from which we call them moon-eyed. Neither in our thoughts in these moonlight walks, methinks, is there the least tincture of a blush or sanguine complexion? But we are intellectually and morally albinos, children of Endymion, 
such as the effect of conversing much with the moon. I complain of Arctic voyagers, that they do not enough remind us of the constant peculiar dreariness of the scenery and the perpetual twilight of the Arctic night. So he whose theme is moonlight, though he may find it difficult, must, as it were, illustrate it with the light of the moon alone. Many men walk by day, few walk by night. It is a very different season. Take a July night, for instance. About ten o'clock, when man is asleep, and day fairly forgotten, the beauty of moonlight is seen over lonely pastures where cattle are silently feeding. On all sides, novelties present themselves. Instead of the sun, there are the moon and stars. Instead of the wood thrush, there is the whippoorwill. Instead of butterflies in the meadows, fireflies, winged sparks of fire, who would have believed it? What kind of cool, deliberate life dwells in those dewy abodes associated with a spark of fire? So man has fire in his eyes, or blood, or brain. Instead of singing birds, the half-throttled note of a cuckoo flying over, the croaking of frogs, and the intenser dream of crickets, but above all the wonderful trump of the bullfrog ringing from Maine to Georgia. The potato vines stand upright. The corn grows apace. The bushes loom. The grain fields are boundless. On our open river terraces, once cultivated by the Indian, they appear to occupy the ground like an army, their heads nodding in the breeze. Small trees and shrubs are seen in the midst, overwhelmed as by an inundation. The shadows of rocks and trees and shrubs and hills are more conspicuous than the objects themselves. The slightest irregularities in the ground are revealed by the shadows, and what the feet find comparatively smooth appears rough and diversified in consequence. For the same reason, the whole landscape is more variegated and picturesque than by day. The smallest recesses in the rocks are dim and cavernous. The ferns in the wood appear of tropical size. The sweet fern and indigo in overgrown wood paths wet you with dew up to your middle. The leaves of the shrub oak are shining as if a liquid were flowing over them. The pools seen through the trees are as full of light as the sky. The light of the day takes refuge in their bosoms, as the Purana says of the ocean. All white objects are more remarkable than by day. A distant cliff looks like a phosphorescent space on a hillside. The woods are heavy and dark. Nature slumbers. You see the moonlight reflected from particular stumps in the recesses of the forest, as if she selected what to shine on. These small fractions of her light remind one of the plant called moon seed, as if the moon were sowing it in such places. In the night, the eyes are partly closed or retire into the head. Other senses take the lead. The walker is guided as well by the sense of smell. Every plant and field and forest emits its odor now. Swamp pink in the meadow 
and tansy in the road, and there is the peculiar dry scent of corn which has begun to show its tassels. The senses both of hearing and smelling are more alert. We hear the tinkling of rills which we never detected before. From time to time, high up on the sides of hills, you pass through a stratum of warm air, a blast which has come up from the sultry plains of noon. It tells of the day, of sunny noontide hours and banks, of the laborer wiping his brow and the bee humming amid flowers. It is an air in which work has been done, which men have breathed. It circulates about from woodside to hillside like a dog that has lost its master now that the sun is gone. The rocks retain all night the warmth of the sun which they have absorbed, and so does the sand. If you dig a few inches into it, you find a warm bed. You lie on your back on a rock in a pasture, on the top of some bare hill at midnight, and speculate on the height of the starry canopy. The stars are the jewels of the night, and perchance surpass anything which day has to show. A companion with whom I was sailing, one very windy but bright moonlit night, when the stars were few and faint, thought that a man could get along with them, though he was considerably reduced in his circumstances, that they were a kind of bread and cheese that never failed. No wonder that there have been astrologers, that some have conceived that they were personally related to particular stars. Dubartis, as translated by Sylvester, says, He'll not believe that the great architect, with all these fires the heavenly arches decked, only for show, and with these glistening shields, to wake poor shepherds watching in the fields. He'll not believe that the least flower which pranks our garden borders or our common banks, and the least stone that in her warming lap our mother earth doth covetously wrap, has some peculiar virtue of its own, and that the glorious stars of heaven have none. And Sir Walter Raleigh well says, the stars are instruments of far greater use than to give an obscure light and for men to gaze on after sunset. And he quotes Plotinus as affirming that they are significant but not efficient, and also Augustine as saying, Deus regit inferiora corpora per superiora. God rules the bodies below, by those above. But best of all is this which another writer has expressed. Sapiens ad juvabit opus astrorum, quemad modum agricola terre naturam. A wise man assisteth the work of the stars, as the husbandman helpeth the nature of the soil. It does not concern men who are asleep in their beds, but it is very important to the traveler whether the moon shines brightly or is obscured. It is not easy to realize the serene joy of all the earth when she commences to shine unobstructedly, unless you have often been abroad alone in moonlit nights. She seems to be waging continual war with the clouds in your behalf. Yet we fancy the clouds to be her foes also. She comes on magnifying her dangers by her light. 
revealing, displaying them in all their hugeness and blackness, then suddenly casts them behind into the light concealed and goes her way triumphant through a small space of clear sky. In short, the moon traversing, or appearing to traverse, the small clouds which lie in her way, now obscured by them, now easily dissipating and shining through them, makes the drama of the moonlit night to all watchers and night travelers. Sailors speak of it as the moon eating up the clouds, the traveler all alone, the moon all alone, except for his sympathy, overcoming with incessant victory whole squadrons of clouds above the forests and lakes and hills. When she enters on a clear field of great extent in the heavens, and shines unobstructedly, he is glad. And when she has fought her way through all the squadron of her foes, and rides majestic in a clear sky unscathed, and there are no more any obstructions in her path, he cheerfully and confidently pursues his way, and rejoices in his heart and the cricket also seems to express joy in its song. How insupportable would be the days if the night with its dews and darkness did not come to restore the drooping world. As the shades begin to gather around us, our primeval instincts are aroused, and we steal forth from our lairs like the inhabitants of the jungle, in search of those silent and brooding thoughts which are the natural prey of the intellect. Richter says that the earth is every day overspread with the veil of night, for the same reason as the cages of birds are darkened, that we may the more readily apprehend the higher harmonies of thought in the hush and quiet of darkness. Thoughts which day turns into smoke and mist stand about us in the night as light and flames, even as the column which fluctuates above the crater of Vesuvius in the daytime appears a pillar of cloud, but by night a pillar of fire. There are nights in this climate of such serene and majestic beauty, so medicinal and fertilizing to the spirit, that methinks a sensitive nature would not devote them to oblivion. And perhaps there is no man but would be better and wiser for spending them out of doors, though he should sleep all the next day to pay for it should sleep an endymion sleep, as the ancients expressed it. Nights which warrant the Grecian epithet ambrosial, when, as in the land of Beulah, the atmosphere is charged with dewy fragrance and with music, and we take our repose and have our dreams awake. When the moon, not secondary to the sun, gives us his blaze again, void of its flame, and sheds a softer day. Now through the passing cloud she seems to stoop, now up the pure cerulean rides sublime. Diana still hunts in the New England sky. In heaven queen she is among the spheres, she, mistress-like, makes all things to be pure. Eternity in her oft change she bears. She, beauty is, by her the fair endure. Time wears her not. She doth his chariot guide. 
mortality below her orb is placed. By her thy virtues of the stars downslide. By her is virtue's perfect image cast. The Hindus compare the moon to a saintly being who has reached the last stage of bodily existence. Great restorer of antiquity, great enchanter, in a mild night when the harvest or hunter's moon shines unobstructedly. The houses in our village, whatever architect they may have had by day, acknowledge only a master. The village street is then as wild as the forest. New and old things are confounded. I know not whether I am sitting on the ruins of a wall or on the material which is to compose a new one. Nature is an instructed and impartial teacher, spreading no crude opinions and flattering none. She will be neither radical nor conservative. Consider the moonlight, so civil yet so savage. The light is more proportionate to our knowledge than that of day. It is no more dusky in ordinary nights than our mind's habitual atmosphere, and the moonlight is as bright as our most illuminated moments are. In such a night let me abroad remain till morning breaks and all's confused again. Of what significance the light of day if it is not the reflection of an inward dawn, to what purpose is the veil of night withdrawn, if the morning reveals nothing to the soul? It is merely garish and glaring. When Ossian, in his address to the sun, exclaims, Where has darkness its dwelling? Where is the cavernous home of the stars? when thou quickly followest their steps, pursuing them like a hunter in the sky, thou climbing the lofty hills, they descending on barren mountains. Who does not in his thought accompany the stars to their cavernous home, descending with them on barren mountains? Nevertheless, even by night the sky is blue and not black, for we see through the shadow of the earth into the distant atmosphere of day where the sunbeams are reveling. The Pond in Winter from Walden After a still winter night, I awoke with the impression that some question had been put to me, which I had been endeavoring in vain to answer in my sleep, as what, how, when, where. But there was dawning nature, in whom all creatures live, looking in at my broad windows with serene and satisfied face and no question on her lips. I awoke to an answered question, to nature and daylight, the snow lying deep on the earth dotted with young pines, and the very slope of the hill on which my house is placed seemed to say forward. Nature puts no question and answers none which we mortals ask. She has long ago taken her resolution. O oh, Prince, our eyes contemplate with admiration and transmit to the soul the wonderful and varied spectacle of this universe. The night veils without doubt a part of this glorious creation, but day comes to reveal to us this great work, which extends from earth even into the plains of the ether. 
then to my morning work. First, I take an axe and pail and go in search of water. After a cold and snowy night, it needed a divining rod to find it. Every winter, the liquid and trembling surface of the pond, which was so sensitive to every breath and reflected every light and shadow, becomes solid to the depth of a foot or a foot and a half, so that it will support the heaviest teams and perchance the snow covers it to an equal depth, and it is not to be distinguished from any level field. Like the marmots in the surrounding hills, it closes its eyelids and becomes dormant for three months or more. Standing on the snow-covered plain, as if in a pasture amid the hills, I cut my way first through a foot of snow, and then a foot of ice, and open a window under my feet, where kneeling to drink, I look down into the quiet parlor of the fishes, pervaded by a softened light, as through a window of ground glass, with its bright sanded floor the same as in summer. There, a perennial, waveless serenity reigns as in the amber twilight sky, corresponding to the cool and even temperament of the inhabitants. Heaven is under our feet, as well as over our heads. Early in the morning, while all things are crisp with frost, men come with fishing reels and slender lunch and let down their fine lines through the snowy field to take pickerel and perch. Wild men, who instinctively follow other fashions and trust other authorities than their townsmen, and by their goings and comings, stitch towns together in parts where else they would be ripped. They sit and eat their luncheon in stout fear knots on the dry oak leaves on the shore, as wise in natural lore as the citizen is in artificial. They never consulted with books, and know and can tell much less than they have done. The things which they practice are said not yet to be known. Here is one fishing for pickerel with grown perch for bait. You look into his pail with wonder as into a summer pond, as if he kept summer locked up at home or knew where she had retreated. How, pray, did he get these in midwinter? Oh, he got worms out of rotten logs since the ground froze, and so he caught them. His life itself passes deeper in nature than the studies of the naturalist penetrate, himself a subject for the naturalist. The latter raises the moss and bark gently with his knife in search of insects. The former lays open logs to their core with his axe, and moss and bark fly far and wide. He gets his living by barking trees. Such a man has some right to fish, and I love to see nature carried out in him. The perch swallows the grub worm, the pickerel swallows the perch, and the fisherman swallows the pickerel, and so all the chinks in the scale of being are filled. When I strolled around the pond in misty weather, I was sometimes amused by the primitive mode which some ruder fisherman had adopted. He would perhaps have placed alder branches over the narrow holes in the ice, which were four or five rods apart and an equal distance from the shore, and having fastened the end of the line to a stick, to prevent it being pulled through, have passed the slack line over a twig of the alder, 
a foot or more above the ice and tied a dry oak leaf to it, which, being pulled down, would show when he had a bite. These alders loomed through the mist at regular intervals as you walked halfway round the pond. Ah, the pickerel of Walden! When I see them lying on the ice, or in the well which the fisherman cuts in the ice, making a little hole to admit the water. I am always surprised by their rare beauty. As if they were fabulous fishes, they are so foreign to the streets, even to the woods, foreign as Arabia to our conquered life. They possess a quite dazzling and transcendent beauty, which separates them by a wide interval from the cadaverous cod and haddock whose fame is trumpeted in our streets. They are not green like the pines, nor gray like the stones, nor blue like the sky, but they have to my eyes, if possible, yet rarer colors, like flowers and precious stones, as if they were the pearls the animalized nuclei of crystals of the Walden water. They, of course, are Walden all over and all through, are themselves small Waldens in the animal kingdom, Waldenses. It is surprising that they are caught here, that in this deep and capacious spring, Far beneath the rattling teams and chaises and tinkling sleighs that travel the Walden Road, this great gold and emerald fish swims. I never chanced to see its kind in any market. It would be the cynosure of all eyes there. Easily, with a few convulsive quirks, they give up their watery ghosts like a mortal translated before his time to the thin air of heaven. As I was desirous to recover the long-lost bottom of Walden Pond, I surveyed it carefully before the ice broke up early in 46, with compass and chain and sounding line. There have been many stories told about the bottom, or rather no bottom of this pond, which certainly had no foundation for themselves. It is remarkable how long men will believe in the bottomlessness of a pond without taking the trouble to sound it. I have visited two such bottomless ponds in one walk in this neighborhood. Many have believed that Walden reached quite through to the other side of the globe. Some who have lain flat on the ice for a long time, looking down through the elusive medium, perchance with watery eyes into the bargain, and driven to hasty conclusions by the fear of catching cold in their breasts, have seen vast holes into which a load of hay might be driven if there were anybody to drive it. The undoubted source of the sticks, and entrance to the infernal regions from these parts. Others have gone down from the village with a fifty-six and a wagon load of inch rope, but yet have failed to find any bottom. For while the fifty-six was resting by the way, they were paying out the rope, in the vain attempt to fathom their truly immeasurable capacity for marvelousness. But I can assure my readers that Walden has a reasonably tight bottom, at a not unreasonable, though at an unusual depth. I fathomed it easily with a cod line and a stone weighing about a pound and a half and could tell accurately when the stone left the bottom by having to pull so much harder before the water got underneath to help me. 
The greatest depth was exactly 102 feet, to which may be added the 5 feet which it has risen since, making 107. This is a remarkable depth for so small an area, yet not an inch of it can be spared by the imagination. What if all ponds were shallow? Would it not react on the minds of men? I am thankful that this pond was made deep and pure for a symbol. While men believe in the infinite, some ponds will be thought to be bottomless. A factory owner, hearing what depth I had found, thought that it could not be true for judging from his acquaintance with dams, sand would not lie at so steep an angle. But the deepest ponds are not so deep in proportion to their area as most suppose, and if drained would not leave very remarkable valleys. They are not like cups between the hills, for this one, which is so unusually deep for its area, appears in a vertical section through its center not deeper than a shallow plate. Most ponds emptied would leave a meadow no more hollow than we frequently see. William Gilpin, who is so admirable in all that relates to landscapes, and usually so correct, standing at the head of Loch Fyne in Scotland, which he describes as a bay of salt water, 60 or 70 fathoms deep, 4 miles in breadth, and about 50 miles long, surrounded by mountains, observes, if we could have seen it immediately after the Diluvian crash, or whatever convulsion of nature occasioned it, before the waters gushed in, what a horrid chasm must it have appeared. But if, using the shortest diameter of Loch Fine, we apply these proportions to Walden, which, as we have seen, appears already in a vertical section only like a shallow plate, it will appear four times as shallow. So much for the increased horrors of the chasm of Loch Fine when emptied. No doubt many a smiling valley, with its stretching cornfields, occupies exactly such a horrid chasm from which the waters have receded, though it requires the insight and the far-sight of the geologist to convince the unsuspecting inhabitants of this fact. Often an inquisitive eye may detect the shores of a primitive lake in the low horizon hills and no subsequent elevation of the plain have been necessary to conceal their history. But it is easiest, as they who work on the highways know, to find the hollows by the puddles after a shower. The amount of it is, the imagination give it the least license, dives deeper and soars higher than nature goes. So, probably, the depth of the ocean will be found to be very inconsiderable compared with its breadth. As I sounded through the ice, I could determine the shape of the bottom with greater accuracy than is possible. In surveying harbors which do not freeze over, and I was surprised at its general regularity. In the deepest part, there are several acres more level than almost any field which is exposed to the sun, wind, and plough. In one instance, on a line arbitrarily chosen, the depth did not vary more than one foot in thirty rods, and generally near the middle. I could calculate the variation for each one hundred feet in any direction beforehand, within three or four inches. Some are accustomed to speak of deep and dangerous holes, even in quiet, sandy ponds like this. 
but the effect of water under these circumstances is to level all inequalities. The regularity of the bottom and its conformity to the shores and the range of the neighboring hills were so perfect that a distant promontory betrayed itself in the soundings quite across the pond and its direction could be determined by observing the opposite shore. Cape becomes bar, and plain shoal, and valley and gorge, deep water and channel. When I had mapped the pond by the scale of ten rods to an inch, and put down the soundings, more than a hundred in all, I observed this remarkable coincidence. Having noticed that the number indicating the greatest depth was apparently in the center of the map, I laid a rule on the map lengthwise and then breadthwise, and found to my surprise that the line of greatest length intersected the line of greatest breadth exactly at the point of greatest depth. Notwithstanding that the middle is so nearly level, the outline of the pond far from regular, and the extreme lengths and breadth were got by measuring into the coves. And I said to myself, who knows but this hint would conduct to the deepest part of the ocean as well as of a pond or puddle. Is not this the rule also for the height of mountains, regarded as the opposite of valleys? We know that a hill is not highest at its narrowest part. Of five coves, three, or all which had been sounded, were observed to have a bar quite across their mouths and deeper water within so that the bay tended to be an expansion of water within the land, not only horizontally, but vertically, and to form a basin or independent pond, the direction of the two capes showing the course of the bar. Every harbor on the sea coast also has its bar at its entrance. In proportion as the mouth of the cove was wider compared with its length, the water over the bar was deeper compared with that in the basin. Given then the length and breadth of the cove and the character of the surrounding shore, and you have almost elements enough to make out a formula for all cases. In order to see how nearly I could guess with this experience at the deepest point in a pond by observing the outlines of a surface and the character of its shores alone, I made a plan of White Pond, which contains about 41 acres, and like this, has no island in it, nor any visible inlet or outlet. And as the line of greatest breadth fell very near the line of least breadth, where two opposite capes approached each other and two opposite bays receded, I ventured to mark a point a short distance from the latter line, but still on the line of greatest length as the deepest. The deepest part was found to be within 100 feet of this, still farther in the direction to which I had inclined, and was only one foot deeper, namely sixty feet. Of course, a stream running through, or an island in the pond, would make the problem much more complicated. If we knew all the laws of nature, we should need only one fact, or the description of one actual phenomenon to infer all the particular results at that point. Now we know only a few laws, and our result is vitiated, not of course by any confusion or irregularity in nature, but by our own ignorance of essential elements in the calculation. 
Our notions of law and harmony are commonly confined to those instances which we detect. But the harmony which results from a far greater number of seemingly conflicting but really concurring laws, which we have not detected, is still more wonderful. The particular laws are as our points of view, as to the traveler a mountain outline varies with every step, and it has an infinite number of profiles, though absolutely but one form. Even when cleft or bored through, it is not comprehended in its entireness. What I have observed of the pond is no less true in ethics. It is the law of average. Such a rule of the two diameters not only guides us toward the sun in the system and the heart in man, but draws lines through the length and breadth of the aggregate of a man's particular daily behaviors and waves of life into his coves and inlets and where they intersect will be the height or depth of his character. Perhaps we need only to know how his shores trend and his adjacent country or circumstances to infer his depth and concealed bottom. If he is surrounded by mountainous circumstances, an Achillean shore whose peaks overshadow and are reflected in his bosom, they suggest a corresponding depth in him. But a low and smooth shore proves him shallow on that side. In our bodies, a bold projecting brow falls off to and indicates a corresponding depth of thought. Also, there is a bar across the entrance of our every cove or particular inclination. Each is our harbor for a season in which we are detained and partially landlocked. These inclinations are not whimsical usually, but their form, size, and direction are determined by their promontories of the shore, the ancient axes of elevation. When this bar is gradually increased by storms, tides, or currents, or there is a subsidence of the waters so that it reaches to the surface, that which was at first but an inclination in the shore in which the thought was harbored becomes an individual lake cut off from the ocean wherein the thought secures its own conditions changes perhaps from salt to fresh, becomes a sweet sea, dead sea, or a marsh. At the advent of each individual into this life, may we not suppose that such a bar has risen to the surface somewhere? It is true we are such poor navigators that our thoughts for the most part stand off and on upon a harborless coast, are conversant only with the bites of the bays of poesy, or steer for the public ports of entry, and go into the dry docks of science, where they merely refit for this world, and no natural currents concur to individualize them. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's readings from Henry David Thoreau. I love how those two essays reveal the breadth of his view of the natural world, from scientific to poetic, and I hope you enjoyed them. If you'd like to read these works for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com, 
I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's readings. Until our next boring book, good night.